so I recognize that there's some facts I may not know that, as well as others, and people are certainly free to correct me. Um, and as you'll see, this is a, a work in progress. Uh, in fact, it was just finished uh, when my predecessor was speaking. Um, so and you should regard it as uh, sort of notes, uh, research notes. Um, Thank you. Um, so that, in fact, he, they 
they move it to, well, anyway, so they, they, they on December 4th, they detail their, by the way, the timer's not moving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we just reset it where you think's wrong. Anyway, so on um, December 4th, he announces that there are going to be uh, proposed reforms. Um, here's, here's the, here's the, Here's the uh, announcement. Okay. So in, in reaction to this, interpretare il sacrificio così efficacemente trasmesso dal ministro Fornero ehm, riguarda la vendicizzazione delle... LTR hasn't been announced yet. So my, my point with that is not to claim that, uh, make claims about Italy's level of spending, but the changes are hard. Uh, this government is regarded as serious, um, and, and that, well, it's regarded as serious. I think it's well known. Uh, then the LTRO is introduced, uh, right here, actually, uh, right here. Uh, and then, then we have the following course of stuff. Okay. Um, and I'm, now I'm going to talk, talk about the LTRO, LTRO in a second. But first, I just want to comment on what happened here in terms of the ECB. The ECB, what's that? Yes. Uh, the ECB, um, well, first of all, high rates create a tendency for governments to fix things. First of all, because they get a lot of political capital, and second, because they feel like fixing things, because things are bad. Um, the ECB, in fact, bought very little compared to what you would expect uh, during this kind of yield crisis. Um, so I th it, it, my, my view, my personal view, is that this was magnificent in action. It's, it's unappreciated and it's incredible. Uh, now let's talk about the mechanics of the LTRO. Oh, before I do that, this is what bank, this is the green line, in case for people who are interested in banks as opposed to countries, the green line is an Italian bank, CDS. Uh, and here, here's where the LTRO is announced, and here's where the budget's announced, and so on. Okay. Um, so, I guess the first thing I want to talk about here is. Um, <coughs> But let's remember, it's a lot of stuff. Reading it's not going to help, probably. But there's a lot of, um, a lot of emphasis on the financing wall of funding and so on coming up acutely. And that's what the three-year LPRO solved. But people forgot something, which is that on October 6th, the ECB announced a one-year, a 13-month LTRO, which would start on exactly the same date as the three-year LTRO ended up starting. Okay, so you know, I suppose I have the documentation if you want to look at it at lunch. The bottom line is that there was already in place a 13-month LTRO starting on exactly the same date as a three-year LTRO. So all the stories about the funding problem, the acute funding problems that would happen in the first quarter of 2012 or any time in 2012 are um, hard to make sense of. And, and I think uh, sort of deducibly false. Uh, next. The MRO, which was already described, is sort of like the LTRO, but it's weekly. It's a, the basic instrument of monetary policy. And um, it, gets a ter it, it gets its haircuts, which I'm not going to define, so fast me lunch, uh, but it's an important feature of them, from something called the single list. Uh, the LTRO, the three-year LTRO, is exactly the same as the, MTRO, uh, as the MRO in, in, in its haircut. It gets its haircut also from the single list, and even if the LTRO has already started, it, the single list is checked daily, and if the single list changes for haircuts for the weekly MRO, it also changes for the already existing 13-month or three-year LTRO. And, and also, the three-year LTRO's rate floats off the MRO's rate. This is sort of important. I'll get to it. So one question is, well, how, how is a, just redoing an MRO over and over, 
different from doing an LTRO? Uh, and the answer is, well, maybe they're not different. Since the MRO, as we learned, it was full allocation since 2008, and it was guaranteed to be so since 2012, for as long as it was going to be full allocation, which means you can get as much as you want, there's absolutely no difference between the three-year LTRO or the 13-month LTRO or any LTRO and the one-year and the MRO. However, and of course, if there had been no three-year LTRO, chances are people wouldn't be, well, uh, anyway, it could be that there's some case the MRO could get a fixed allocation instead of a floating allocation. This is, of course, the risk, and I'm not going to go through all the details, but, I, but since the LTRO floats off the MRO in terms of the rate, basically you, you can get a small difference between the <coughs> LTRO rate and the MRO rate, uh, and it's, it's quantifiable and it's tiny. It would be a subsidy of a billion or two billion dollars a year only if the MRO becomes fixed allocation. So. It would be surprising if the, putting aside my argument about the 13 month LTRO, it would be surprising if the MRO um, changed the course of European history because it's a tiny subset. If the, LTRO, the three year LTRO, differentially from the MRO, which was, which was unlimited since 2008, changed the course of European history. Um, in addition, by the way, the LTRO rate, no, let's get that. Okay. Um, fine. For those of you who think in terms of repo, and think the LTRO is a long-term repo, it's not compared to some of this. Uh, and these are just uh, documents explaining, going through some of this stuff, not me. Okay, now, so what is the harm in doing and having three year LTRO? LTRO? I certainly have a problem with banks providing, central bank providing liquidity. Uh, so what are some of the problems? However, if it's not necessary, maybe. In any event, here's some of the problems. Um, the first one is uh, the subordination of unsecured debt. Uh, you can get a spiral out of this. So when, when, when liquidity is provided, the subordinated debt of banks is, uh, these unsecured debt of banks become subordinated. The more liquidity is provided, the more it becomes uh, subordinated, and then you get a spiral, which is the Martin Schmaltz spiral, coming out of that, you can explain it at lunch. Um, the, 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 the banks also need to fund their losses. So this sounds like a small matter. But when I last looked, all Spain's purchases since the LTRO were underwater. Uh, all Spanish banks rather purchased were underwater, so they'd actually have to come up with more cash, and the market market equity is lower. So this is a risk. Um, why did why did banks take a lot? Uh, so there's a small there's a small potential in the future yield advantage. Also, there was there's NCB nagging. This is anecdotal, but it's anecdotal from so many people. Everyone you ask who seems to know a bank has a story about NCBs trying to get banks to take up LTRO. Uh, that, that, that was one explanation of the high rate. There's also a reverse stigma, which grows since December. The idea here is that um, you know, the, the board of a bank will say to the CFO, we heard about this wonderful three-year LTRO stuff, but we don't have any. Uh, and so the CFO sort of you know, is, is pressured both by that and by the central bank trying to get them to take some, that, he, that they take more. And it's surprising that at the end of February, where stress is low, uh, the net uptake uh, adjusted for some stuff it is 75% um, larger than it was the first time. Um, it could be additional credit claims, but, they, but they're actually quite small. So it, it, it doesn't prove anything, but it's, it's uh, instructive. Um, comment on bond buying by banks. Uh, Italian banks started, well, so there's an idea separate from the wall, the wall of you know, preventing the financial collapse of banks because of the refunding, which is that banks were induced to buy uh, Italian uh, sovereign debt, rather, and this um, has made a big difference. So first of all, you have to keep in mind that, you know, you have to remember there's a big world out there. Italian banks started with only 15% of outstanding Italian bonds. So there's a lot of people to sell to them. The standard market reaction to news of slow moving non economic demand, which in this case would be NCB nagging, is to rise before it front runs the slow moving demand and then sell to it, uh, leading to no change in prices. It, it, from the numbers, as best I can tell right now, it looks like the holders of Italian bonds, except for banks, sold significantly more um, debt than Italy itself net sold in, the, in these four months. Uh, and that doesn't even count shorting, so you know, the price is too high because there's non economic demand goes to get shorting. Um, and all this whole thing feels like it might have pushed banks into bond positions, um, which means we get more of what Marcus calls the diabolical loop problem, 
which is uh, the, the co-evolution of sovereign bank, sovereigns and banks with key bank. Um, okay. Right. Um, so I talked about this. Here's another way to use the fact that there was an LTRO announced on October 6th um, to, to sort of think about what happened. Um, so given, there were actually two LTROs announced on October 6th. Uh, oh, keeping in mind that the three-year LTRO was, it was uh, announced December 8th, uh, which is here, as you know, uh, for um, sort of, uh, for settlement December 27th. So um, here we're looking at a, at a one-year bond in blue. So one-year bond is LTRO protected starting on October 6th. Uh, and there's actually an LTRO that settles, up, there's one year LTRO that settles on October 27th. It provides full coverage for this bond. Yet it goes to higher levels than any other bond, any other Italian bond, even though it's uh, susceptible to the enormous arbitrage of, of banks buying this and making all that spread. And it also declines more than any other maturity, and it also declines somewhat monotonically. So it tells a story that has nothing to do with the three year LTRO, which was announced later. It was a simple story of probability of near-term default, and that, that's how I would interpret that, and I, I think it fits the news facts. Um, just a little, another little way to take a look at what's going on is these, this is a succession of yield curves, the lowest one in uh, white being the Italian yield curve, I think, at the start of February. This is the three-year point, and that's the four-year point. You would expect, if there were a differential effect in three-year LTRO, that that would be very, very steep. In fact, it's sort of pathological, it's sort of oddly, oddly uh, shallow. Um, amusing fact is that the private, there is a private repo market, as it turns out, through January, this is the size of the private, the private repo, repo market is in blue, and the ECB repo is in green. Um, an amusing fact, according to ECB statistics, as well as we can interpret them, the private repo market in December declined almost exactly as much as the uh, net add of the LTRO. <coughs> it could be crowding out, it could be, you know, it, it just rushing in because the repo market disappeared. Although it didn't disappear in November when stress was very high. Um, so th this, is, th this, uh, this is a list of of other uh, claims about the LTRO and its mechanism for action. I'll just talk about this one, which is not only really the LTRO, but dollar funding, which was announced on November 30th. Uh, uh, so what was actually announced was a 50 basis point reduction in available dollar funding for non-dollar collateral uh, in the first of the monthly three-month auctions uh, that was held after this uh, announcement of price cut. $50 billion uh, of lending was auctioned off so with an approximate benefit of $65 million for this monthly auction. So that is uh, not a large number. Um, and just documentation of that. So what is the cost of getting the LTRO story wrong? I mean, I certainly have no problem with the central bank funding, but why do I care that this may be misunderstood? The first reason is that it undermines reform. Uh, the misattribution of the cause of the rate decline saps governments of energy and political capital. You know, they do all this hard work, and then, um, and then they read in the newspaper that they really didn't do anything, and it was just a central bank waving its magic wand. And you know, it makes it hard. Makes it, it, to the extent that it is believed, either by governments or by people, it undermines uh, undermines reform. And um, it, it uh, you know, the, the ECB can then can then later say, "We urge you to reform," but it doesn't. It's not that moving, especially when yields have come down and it's misattributed. Uh, it raises the probability of doing this again to solve a future stress problem. If it wasn't the solution, it won't be the solution next time, and that's dangerous. It causes uh, an unnecessary intra-euro system discord. So there's some central banks in the euro system which have a reasonable conservation of happiness principle. If things are good now, we're going to pay for it later. Uh, so they are, it, need, it wouldn't be surprising if the three-year LTRO didn't bother them nearly as much uh, as it wouldn't have bothered it nearly as much if it hadn't been attributed, if all this uh, success hadn't been attributed to it. But since it was, and it causes concern, of course, it's not good for central bank credibility. Um, in addition, there are risks from the existence of too much of this financing, not just from misunderstanding it. One risk is it intensifies the diabolical loop, which, is, which I described already. 
Uh, the other is um, you get a system-wide subordination spiral, which I mentioned, the mouth spiral. Uh, systemic margin spiral, which Martin has described, it tends to raise target two, which has its own run dynamics. Um, and I just asked the question, has this actually reduced or raised tail risk? Um, why was I initially interested in this topic? Who cares? Uh, I mean, you know what, I, I, don't, I, don't know, I didn't know these details before researching it. And the reason is that central bank observations of liquidity as a problem or solution are, used, are sometimes incorrect. And so I was attracted to this question. Um, central banks are subject to Maslow's law of the instrument uh, with respect to liquidity. I'm going to have to give my glossary of things I learned, terms I learned in researching this piece. Uh, Maslow's law of the instrument comes from 1966. Here it is. If all you have is a hammer, then everything tends to look like a nail. <coughs> doctrine that pessimistic market prices are never related to fundamentals because the bad equilibrium liquidity seldom fulfilling prophecy spiral. Practitioners are called spiralists. <laughs> and then I learned about the post hoc fallacy. Post hoc or no proper hoc. The logical fallacy that succession applies causation. As you see here, the LTRO happened here, then we would see succession applies causation <coughs> fallacy, and maybe we believe it. On the other hand, here we have that this enormous drop happens, and then it's a, and then we do the action, and then we say causation is implied. So we have a new fallacy, which is anti-hoc, ergo propter hoc, uh, pre preceding implies causation. And you can email me, Jacob, at anti-hoc. 